twelve causes of dishonesty by rev henry ward beecher this is a librivox recording read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. twelve causes of dishonesty only extraordinary circumstances can give the appearance of dishonesty to an honest man usually not to seem honest is not to be so the quality must not be doubtful like twilight lingering between night and day and taking hues from both it must be daylight clear and effulgent this is the doctrine of the bible providing for honest things not only in the sight of the lord but also in the sight of men in general it may be said that no one has honesty without dross until he has honesty without suspicion we are passing through times upon which the seeds of dishonesty have been sown broadcast and they have brought forth a hundredfold these times will pass away but like ones will come again as physicians study the causes and record the phenomena of plagues and pestilences to draw from them an antidote against their recurrence so should we leave to another generation a history of moral plagues as the best antidote to their recurring malignity upon a land capacious beyond measure whose prodigal soil rewards labor with an unharvestable abundance of exuberant fruits occupied by a people signalized by enterprise and industry there came a summer of prosperity which lingered so long and shone so brightly that men forgot that winter could ever come each day grew brighter no rains were put upon the imagination its dreams passed for realities even sober men touched with wildness seemed to expect a realization of oriental tales upon this bright day came sudden frosts storms and blight men awoke from gorgeous dreams in the midst of desolation the harvests of years were swept away in a day the strongest forms were rent as easily as the oak by lightning speculating companies were dispersed as seared leaves from a tree in autumn merchants were ruined by thousands clerks turned adrift by ten thousands mechanics were left in idleness farmers sighed over flocks and wheat as useless as the stones and dirt the wide sea of commerce was stagnant upon the realm of industry settled down a sullen lethargy out of this reverse swarmed an unnumbered host of dishonest men like vermin from a carcass banks were exploded or robbed or fleeced by astounding forgeries mighty companies without cohesion went to pieces and hordes of wretches snatched up every bale that came ashore cities were ransacked by troops of villains the unparalleled frauds which sprung like mines on every hand set every man to trembling lest the next explosion should be under his own feet fidelity seemed to have forsaken men many that had earned a reputation for sterling honesty were cast so suddenly headlong into wickedness that man shrank from man suspicion overgrew confidence and the heart bristled with the nettles and thorns of fear and jealousy then had almost come to pass the divine delineation of ancient wickedness the good man is perished out of the earth and there is none upright among men they all lie in wait for blood they hunt every man his brother with a net that they may do evil with both hands earnestly the prince and the judge ask for a reward and the great man uttereth his mischievous desire so they wrap it up the best of them is a briar the most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge the world looked upon a continent of inexhaustible fertility whose harvest had glutted the markets and rotted in disuse filled with lamentation and its inhabitants wandering like bereaved citizens among the ruins of an earthquake mourning for children for houses crushed and property buried for ever that no measure might be put to the calamity the church of god which rises a stately tower of refuge to desponding men seemed now to have lost its power of protection 
when the solemn voice of religion should have gone over the land as the call of god to guilty man to seek in him their strength in this time when religion should have restored sight to the blind made the lame to walk and bound up the broken-hearted she was herself mourning in sackcloth out of her courts came the noise of warring sects some contending against others with bitter warfare and some possessed of a demon wallowed upon the ground foaming and rending themselves in a time of panic and disaster and distress and crime the fountain which should have been for the healing of men cast up its sediments and gave out a bitter stream of pollution in every age an universal pestilence has hushed the clamour of contention and cooled the heats of parties but the greatness of our national calamity seemed only to enkindle the fury of political parties contentions never ran with such deep streams and impetuous currents as amidst the ruin of our industry and prosperity states were greater debtors to foreign nations than their citizens were to each other both states and citizens shrunk back from their debts and yet more dishonestly from the taxes necessary to discharge them the general government did not escape but lay becalmed or pursued its course like a ship at every furlong touching the rocks or beating against the sands the capital trembled with the first waves of a question which is yet to shake the whole land new questions of exciting qualities perplexed the realm of legislation and of morals to all this must be added a manifest decline of family government an increase of the ratio of popular ignorance a decrease of reverence for law and an effeminate administration of it popular tumults have been as frequent as freshets in our rivers and like them have swept over the land with desolation and left their filthy slime in the highest places upon the press upon the legislature in the halls of our courts and even upon the sacred bench of justice if unsettled times foster dishonesty it should have flourished among us and it has our nation must expect a periodical return of such convulsions but experience should steadily curtail their ravages and remedy their immoral tendencies young men have before them lessons of manifold wisdom taught by the severest of masters experience they should be studied and that they may be i shall from this general survey turn to a specific enumeration of the causes of dishonesty one some men find in their bosom from the first a vehement inclination to dishonest ways knavish propensities are inherent born with the child and transmissible from parent to son the children of a sturdy thief if taken from him at birth and reared by honest men would doubtless have to contend against a strongly dishonest inclination foundlings and orphans under public charitable charge are more apt to become vicious than other children they are usually born of low and vicious parents and inherit their parents propensities only the most thorough moral training can overrule this innate depravity two a child naturally fair-minded may become dishonest by parental example he is early taught to be sharp in bargains and vigilant for every advantage little is said about honesty and much upon shrewd traffic a dexterous trick becomes a family anecdote visitors are regaled with the boy's precocious keenness hearing the praise of his exploits he studies craft and seeks parental admiration by adroit knaveries he is taught for his safety that he must not range beyond the law that would be unprofitable he calculates his morality thus legal honesty is the best policy dishonesty then is a bad bargain and therefore wrong everything is wrong which is unthrifty whatever profit breaks no legal statute though it is gained by falsehood by unfairness by gloss through dishonor unkindness and an unscrupulous conscience he considers fair and says the law allows it men may spend a long life without an indictable action 
and without an honest one no law can reach the insidious ways of subtle craft the law allows and religion forbids men to profit by others misfortunes to prowl for prey among the ignorant to overreach the simple to suck the vast life drops from the bleeding to hover over men as a vulture over herds swooping down upon the weak the straggling and the weary the infernal craft of cunning men turns the law itself to piracy and works outrageous fraud in the hall of courts by the decision of judges and is under the seal of justice three dishonesty is learned from one's employers the boy of honest parents and honestly bred goes to a trade or a store where the employer practices legal frauds the plain honesty of the boy excites roars of laughter among the better taught clerks the master tells them that such blundering truthfulness must be pitied the boy evidently has been neglected and is not to be ridiculed for what he could not help at first it verily pains the youth's scruples and tinges his face to frame a deliberate dishonesty to finish and to polish it his tongue stammers at a lie but the example of a rich master the jeers and jibes of shopmates with gradual practice cure all this he becomes adroit in fleecing customers for his master's sake and equally dexterous in fleecing his master for his own sake four extravagance is a prolific source of dishonesty extravagance which is foolish expense or expense disproportionate to one's means may be found in all grades of society but it is chiefly apparent among the rich those aspiring to wealth and those wishing to be thought affluent many a young man cheats his business by transferring his means to theatres race courses expensive parties and to the nameless and numberless projects of pleasure the enterprise of others is baffled by the extravagance of their family for few men can make as much in a year as an extravagant woman can carry on her back in one winter some are ambitious of fashionable society and will gratify their vanity at any expense this disproportion between means and expense soon brings on a crisis the victim is straitened for money without it he must abandon his rank for fashionable society remorselessly rejects all butterflies which have lost their brilliant colors which shall he choose honesty and mortifying exclusion or gaiety purchased by dishonesty the severity of this choice sometimes sobers the intoxicated brain and a young man shrinks from the gulf appalled at the darkness of dishonesty but to excessive vanity high life with or without fraud is paradise and any other life purgatory here many resort to dishonesty without a scruple it is at this point that public sentiment half sustains dishonesty it scourges the thief of necessity and pities the thief of fashion the struggle with others is on the very ground of honor a wife led from affluence to frigid penury and neglect from leisure and luxury to toil and want daughters once courted as rich to be disesteemed when poor this is the gloomy prospect seen through a magic haze of despondency honor love and generosity strangely bewitched plead for dishonesty as the only alternative to such suffering but go young man to your wife tell her the alternative if she is worthy of you she will face your poverty with a courage which shall shame your fears and lead you into its wilderness and through it all unshrinking many there be who went weeping into this desert and ere long having found in it the fountains of the purest peace have thanked god for the pleasures of poverty but if your wife unmans your resolution imploring dishonor rather than penury may god pity and help you you dwell with a sorceress and few can resist her wiles five debt is an inexhaustible fountain of dishonesty the royal preacher tells us the borrower is servant to the lender debt is a rigorous servitude 
the debtor learns the cunning tricks delays concealments and frauds by which slaves evade or cheat their master he is tempted to make ambiguous statements pledges with secret passages of escape contracts with fraudulent constructions lying excuses and more mendacious promises he is tempted to elude responsibility to delay settlements to prevaricate upon the terms to resist equity and devise specious fraud when the eager creditor would restrain such vagrancy by law the debtor often thinks himself released from moral obligation and brought to a legal game in which it is lawful for the best player to win he disputes true accounts he studies subterfuges extorts provocatist delays and harbors in every nook and corner and passage of the law's labyrinth at length the measure is filled up and the malignant power of debt is known it has opened in the heart every fountain of iniquity it has besoiled the conscience it has tarnished the honor it has made the man a deliberate student of knavery a systematic practitioner of fraud it has dragged him through all the sewers of petty passions anger hate revenge malicious folly or malignant shame when a debtor is beaten at every point and the law will put her screws upon him there is no depth in the gulf of dishonesty into which he will not boldly plunge some men put their property to the flames assassinate the detested creditor and end the frantic tragedy by suicide or the gallows others in view of the catastrophe have converted all property to cash and concealed it the law's utmost skill and the creditor's fury are alike powerless now the tree is green and thrifty its roots drawing a copious supply from some hidden fountain craft has another harbor of resort for the piratical crew of dishonesty that is putting the property out of the law's reach by a fraudulent conveyance whoever runs in debt and consumes the equivalent of his indebtedness whoever is fairly liable to damage for broken contracts whoever by folly has incurred debts and lost the benefit of his outlay whoever is legally obliged to pay for his malice or carelessness whoever by infidelity to public trusts has made his property a just remuneration for his defaults whoever of all these or whoever under any circumstances puts out of his hands property morally or legally due to creditors is a dishonest man the crazy excuses which men render to their consciences are only such as every villain makes who is unwilling to look upon the black face of his crimes he who will receive a conveyance of property knowing it to be elusive and fraudulent is as wicked as the principal and as such meaner as the tool and subordinate of villainy is meaner than the master who uses him if a church knowing all these facts or willfully ignorant of them allows a member to nestle in the security of the sanctuary then the act of this robber and the connivance of the church are but two parts of one crime six bankruptcy although a branch of debt deserves a separate mention it sometimes crushes a man's spirit and sometimes exasperates it the poignancy of the evil depends much upon the disposition of the creditors and as much upon the disposition of the victim should they act with the lenity of christian men and he with manly honesty promptly rendering up whatever satisfaction of debt he has he may visit the lowest places of human adversity and find there the light of good men's esteem the support of conscience and the sustenance of religion a bankrupt may fall into the hands of men whose tender mercies are cruel or his dishonest equivocations may exasperate their temper and provoke every thorn and briar of the law when men's passions are let loose especially their avarice wedded by real or imaginary wrong when there is a rivalry among creditors lest any one should feast upon the victim more than his share and they all rush upon him like wolves upon a wounded deer dragging him down ripping him open breast and flank 
plunging deep their bloody muzzles to reach the heart and taste blood at the very fountain is it strange that resistance is desperate and unscrupulous at length the sufferer drags his mutilated carcass aside every nerve and muscle wrung with pain and his whole body an instrument of agony he curses the whole inhuman crew with envenomed imprecations and thenceforth a brooding misanthrope he pays back to society by studied villainies the legal wrongs which the relentless justice of a few or his own knavery have brought upon him seven there is a circle of moral dishonesties practised because the law allows them the very anxiety of law to reach the devices of cunning so perplexes its statutes with exceptions limitations and supplements that like a castle gradually enlarged for centuries it has its crevices dark corners secret holes and winding passages an endless harbour for rats and vermin where no trap can catch them we are villainously infested with legal rats and rascals who are able to commit the most flagrant dishonesties with impunity they can do all of wrong which is profitable without that part which is actionable the very ingenuity of these miscreants excites such admiration of their skill that their life is gilded with a specious respectability men profess little esteem for blunt necessitous thieves who rob and run away but for a gentleman who can break the whole of god's law so adroitly as to leave man's law unbroken who can indulge in such conservative stealing that his fellow men award him a rank among honest men for the excessive skill of his dishonesty for such a one i fear there is almost universal sympathy eight political dishonesty breeds dishonesty of every kind it is possible for good men to permit single sins to coexist with general integrity where the evil is indulged through ignorance once undoubted christians were slave traders they might be while unenlightened but not in our times a state of mind which will intend one fraud will upon occasions intend a thousand he that upon one emergency will lie will be supplied with emergencies he that will perjure himself to save a friend will do it in a desperate juncture to save himself the highest wisdom has informed us that he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much circumstances may withdraw a politician from temptation to any but political dishonesty but under temptation a dishonest politician would be a dishonest cashier would be dishonest anywhere in anything the fury which destroys an opponent's character would stop at nothing if barriers were thrown down that which is true of the leaders in politics is true of subordinates political dishonesty in voters runs into general dishonesty as the rotten speck taints the whole apple a community whose politics are conducted by a perpetual breach of honesty on both sides will be tainted by immorality throughout men will play the same game in their private affairs which they have learned to play in public matters the guile the crafty vigilance the dishonest advantage the cunning sharpness the tricks and traps and sly evasions the equivocal promises and unequivocal neglect of them which characterize political action will equally characterize private action the mind has no kitchen to do its dirty work in while the parlor remains clean dishonesty is an atmosphere if it comes into one apartment it penetrates into every one whoever will lie in politics will lie in traffic whoever will slander in politics will slander in personal squabbles a professor of religion who is a dishonest politician is a dishonest christian his creed is a perpetual index of his hypocrisy the genius of our government directs the attention of every citizen to politics its spirit reaches the uttermost bound of society and pervades the whole mass if its channels are slimy with corruption what limit can be set to its malign influence 
the turbulence of elections the virulence of the press the desperation of bad men the hopelessness of efforts which are not cunning but only honest have driven many conscientious men from any concern with politics this is suicidal thus the tempest will grow blacker and fiercer our youth will be caught up in its whirling bosom and dashed to pieces and its hail will break down every green thing at god's house the cure should begin let the hand of discipline smite the leprous lips which shall utter the profane heresy all is fair in politics if any hoary professor drunk with the mingled wine of excitement shall tell our youth that a christian man may act in politics by any other rule of morality than that of the bible and that wickedness performed for a party is not as abominable as if done for a man or that any necessity justifies or palliates dishonesty in word or deed let such a one go out of the camp and his pestilent breath no longer spread contagion among our youth no man who loves his country should shrink from her side when she groans with raging distempers let every christian man stand in his place rebuke every dishonest practice scorn a political as well as a personal lie and refuse with indignation to be insulted by the solicitation of an immoral man let good men of all parties require honesty integrity veracity and morality in politics as there as powerfully as anywhere else the requisitions of public sentiment will ultimately be felt nine a corrupt public sentiment produces dishonesty a public sentiment in which dishonesty is not disgraceful in which bad men are respectable are trusted are honored are exalted is a curse to the young the fever of speculation the universal derangement of business the growing laxness of morals is to an alarming extent introducing such a state of things men of notorious immorality whose dishonesty is flagrant whose private habits would disgrace the ditch are powerful and popular i have seen a man stained with every sin except those which required courage into whose head i do not think a pure thought has entered for forty years in whose heart an honourable feeling would droop for very loneliness in evil he was ripe and rotten hoary and depraved indeed in word in his present life and in all his past evil when by himself and viler among men corrupting to the young to domestic fidelity a recreant to common honour a traitor to honesty an outlaw to religion a hypocrite base in all that is worthy of man and accomplished in whatever is disgraceful and yet this wretch could go where he would enter good man's dwellings and purloin their votes men would curse him yet obey him hate him and assist him warn their sons against him and lead them to the polls for him a public sentiment which produces ignominious knaves cannot breed honest men any calamity civil or commercial which checks the administration of justice between man and man is ruinous to honesty the violent fluctuations of business cover the ground with rubbish over which men stumble and fill the air with dust in which all the shapes of honesty appear distorted men are thrown upon unusual expedients dishonesties are unobserved those who have been reckless and profuse stave off the legitimate fruits of their folly by desperate shifts we have not yet emerged from a period in which debts were insecure the debtor legally protected against the rights of the creditor taxes laid not by the requirements of justice but for political effect and lowered to a dishonest insufficiency and when thus diminished not collected the citizens resisting their own officers officers resigning at the bidding of the electors the laws of property paralyzed bankrupt laws built up and stay laws unconstitutionally enacted upon which the courts look with aversion yet fear to deny them lest the wildness of popular opinion should roll back disdainfully upon the bench to despoil its dignity and to prostrate its power 
general suffering has made us tolerant of general dishonesty and the gloom of our commercial disaster threatens to become the pall of our morals if the shocking stupidity of the public mind to atrocious dishonesties is not aroused if good men do not bestir themselves to drag the young from this foul sorcery if the relaxed bands of honesty are not tightened and conscience intoned to a severer morality our night is at hand our midnight not far off woe to that guilty people who sit down upon broken laws and wealth saved by injustice woe to a generation fed upon the bread of fraud whose children's inheritance shall be a perpetual memento of their father's unrighteousness to whom dishonesty shall be made pleasant by association with the revered memories of father brother and friend but when a whole people united by a common disregard of justice conspire to defraud public creditors and states vie with states in an infamous repudiation of just debts by open or sinister methods and nations exert their sovereignty to protect and dignify the knavery of a commonwealth then the confusion of domestic affairs has bred a fiend before whose flight honor fades away and under whose feet the sanctity of truth and the religion of solemn compacts are stamped down and ground into the dirt need we ask the causes of growing dishonesty among the young and the increasing untrustworthiness of all agents when states are seen clothed with the panoply of dishonesty and nations put on fraud for their garments absconding agents swindling schemes and defalcations occurring in such melancholy abundance have at length ceased to be wonders and rank with the common accidents of fire and flood the budget of each week is incomplete without its mob and runaway cashier its duel and defaulter and as waves which roll to the shore are lost in those which follow on so the villainies of each week obliterate the record of the last the mania of dishonesty cannot arise from local causes it is the result of disease in the whole community an eruption betokening foulness of the blood blotches symptomatic of a disordered system ten financial agents are especially liable to the temptations of dishonesty safe merchants and visionary schemers sagacious adventurers and rash speculators frugal beginners and retired millionaires are constantly around them every word every act every entry every letter suggests only wealth its germ its bud its blossom its golden harvest its brilliance dazzles the sight its seductions stir the appetites its power fires the ambition and the soul concentrates its energies to obtain wealth as life's highest and only joy besides the influence of such associations direct dealing in money as a commodity has a peculiar effect upon the heart there is no property between it and the mind no medium to mellow its light the mind is diverted and refreshed by no thoughts upon the quality of soils the durability of structures the advantages of sites the beauty of fabrics it is not invigorated by the necessity of labor and ingenuity which the mechanic feels by the invention of the artisan or the taste of the artist the whole attention falls directly upon naked money the hourly sight of it whets the appetite and sharpens it to avarice thus with an intense regard of riches steals in also the miser's relish of coin that insatiate gazing and fondling by which seductive metal wins to itself all the blandishments of love those who mean to be rich often begin by imitating the expensive courses of those who are rich they are also tempted to venture before they have means of their own in brilliant speculations how can a young cashier pay the drafts of his illicit pleasures or procure the seed for the harvest of speculation out of his narrow salary here first begins to work the leaven of death the mind wanders in dreams of gain it broods over projects of unlawful riches stealthily at first 
and then with less reserve at last it boldly meditates the possibility of being dishonest and safe when a man can seriously reflect upon dishonesty as a possible and profitable thing he is already deeply dishonest to a mind so tainted will flock stories of consummate craft of effective knavery of fraud covered by its brilliant success at times the mind shrinks from its own thoughts and trembles to look down the giddy cliff on whose edge they poise or over which they fling themselves like sporting sea-birds but these imaginations will not be driven from the heart where they have once nested they hunt a man's business visit him in his dreams and vampire-like fan the slumbers of the victim whom they will destroy in some feverish hour vibrating between conscience and avarice the man staggers to a compromise to satisfy his conscience he refuses to steal and to gratify his avarice he borrows the funds not openly not of owners not of men but of the till the safe the vault he resolves to restore the money before discovery can ensue and pocket the profits meanwhile false entries are made perjured oaths are sworn forged papers are filed his expenses grow profuse and men wonder from what fountain so copious a stream can flow let us stop here to survey his condition he flourishes is called prosperous thinks himself safe is he safe or honest he has stolen and embarked the amount upon a sea over which wander perpetual storms whose wreck is the common fate and escape the accident and now all his chance for the semblance of honesty is staked upon the return of his embezzlements from among the sands the rocks and currents the winds and waves and darkness of tumultuous speculation at length dawns the day of discovery his guilty dreams have long foretokened it as he confronts the disgrace almost face to face how changed is the hideous aspect of his deed from that fair face of promise with which it tempted him conscience and honour and plain honesty which left him when they could not restrain now come back to sharpen his anguish overawed by the prospect of open shame of his wife's disgrace and his children's beggary he cows down and slinks out of life a frantic suicide some there be however less supple to shame they meet their fate with cool impudence defy their employers brave the court and too often with success the delusion of the public mind or the confusion of affairs is such that while petty culprits are tumbled into prison a cool calculating and immense scoundrel is pitied dandled and nursed by a sympathizing community in the broad road slanting to the rogue's retreat are seen the officer of the bank the agent of the state the officer of the church in indiscriminate haste outrunning a lazy justice and bearing off the gains of astounding frauds avarice and pleasure seem to have dissolved the conscience it is a day of trouble and of perplexity from the lord we tremble to think that our children must leave the covert of the family and go out upon that dark and yeasty sea from whose wrath so many wrecks are cast up at our feet of one thing i am certain if the church of christ is silent to such deeds and makes her altar a refuge to such dishonesty the day is coming when she shall have no altar the light shall go out from her candlestick her walls shall be desolate and the fox look out at her windows eleven executive clemency by its frequency has been a temptation to dishonesty who will fear to be a culprit when a legal sentence is the argument of pity and the prelude of pardon what can the community expect but growing dishonesty when juries connive at acquittals and judges condemn only to petition a pardon when honest men and officers fly before a mob when jails are besieged and threatened if felons are not relinquished when the executive consulting the spirit of the community 
receives the demands of the mob and humbly complies throwing down the fences of the law that base rioters may walk unimpeded to their work of vengeance or unjust mercy a sickly sentimentality too often enervates the administration of justice and the pardoning power becomes the master key to let out unwashed unrepentant criminals they have fleeced us robbed us and are ulcerous sores to the body politic yet our heart turns to water over their merited punishment a fine young fellow by accident writes another's name for his own by a mistake equally unfortunate he presents it at the bank innocently draws out the large amount generously spends a part and absent-mindedly hides the rest hard-hearted wretches there are who would punish him for this young men admiring the neatness of the affair pity his misfortune and curse a stupid jury that knew no better than to send to the penitentiary him whose skill deserved a cashiership he goes to his cell the pity of a whole metropolis bulletins from sing sing inform us daily what edwards is doing footnote monroe edwards a notorious forger editor and footnote as if he were napoleon at st helena at length pardoned he will go forth again to a renowned liberty if there be one way quicker than another by which the executive shall assist crime and our laws foster it it is that course which assures every dishonest man that it is easy to defraud easy to avoid arrest easy to escape punishment and easiest of all to obtain a pardon twelve commercial speculations are prolific of dishonesty speculation is the risking of capital in enterprises greater than we can control or in enterprises whose elements are not at all calculable all calculations of the future are uncertain but those which are based upon long experience approximate certainty while those which are drawn by sagacity from probable events are notoriously unsafe unless however some venture we shall forever tread an old and dull path therefore enterprise is allowed to pioneer new ways the safe enterpriser explores cautiously ventures at first a little and increases the venture with the ratio of experience a speculator looks out upon the new region as upon a faraway landscape whose features are softened to beauty by distance upon a hope he stakes that which if it wins will make him and if it loses will ruin him when the alternatives are victory or utter destruction a battle may sometimes still be necessary but commerce has no such alternatives only speculation proceeds upon them if the capital is borrowed it is as dishonest upon such ventures to risk as to lose it should a man borrow a noble steed and ride among incitements which he knew would rouse up his fiery spirit to an uncontrollable height and borne away with wild speed be plunged over a precipice his destruction might excite our pity but could not alter our opinion of his dishonesty he borrowed property and endangered it where he knew that it would be uncontrollable if the capital be one's own it can scarcely be risked and lost without the ruin of other men no man could blow up his store in a compact street and destroy only his own men of business are like threads of a fabric woven together and subject to a great extent to a common fate of prosperity or adversity i have no right to cut off my hand i defraud myself my family my community and god for all these have an interest in that hand neither has a man the right to throw away his property he defrauds himself his family the community in which he dwells for all these have an interest in that property if waste is dishonesty then every risk in proportion as it approaches it is dishonest to venture without that foresight which experience gives is wrong and if we cannot foresee then we must not venture 
scheming speculation demoralizes honesty and almost necessitates dishonesty he who puts his own interests to rash ventures will scarcely do better for others the speculator regards the weightiest affair as only a splendid game indeed a speculator on the exchange and a gambler at his table follow one vocation only with different instruments one employs cards or dice the other property the one can no more foresee the result of his schemes than the other what spots will come up on his dice the calculations of both are only the chances of luck both burn with unhealthy excitement both are avaricious of gains but careless of what they win both depend more upon fortune than skill they have a common distaste for labor with each right and wrong are only the accidents of a game neither would scruple in any hour to set his whole being on the edge of ruin and going over to pull down if possible a hundred others the wreck of such men leaves them with a drunkard's appetite and a fiend's desperation the revulsion from extravagant hopes to a certainty of midnight darkness the sensations of poverty to him who was in fancy just stepping upon a princely estate the humiliation of gleaning for cents where he has been profuse of dollars the chagrin of seeing old competitors now above him grinning down upon his poverty a malignant triumph the pity of pitiful men and the neglect of such as should have been his friends and who were while the sunshine lay upon his path all these things like so many strong winds sweep across the soul so that it cannot rest in the cheerless tranquillity of honesty but casts up mire and dirt how stately the balloon rises and sails over the continents as over petty landscapes the slightest slit in its frail covering sends it tumbling down swaying widely whirling and pitching hither and thither until it plunges into some dark glen out of the path of honest men and too shattered to tempt even a robber so have we seen a thousand men pitched down so now in a thousand places may their wrecks be seen but still other balloons are framing and the air is full of victim venturers if our young men are introduced to life with distaste for safe ways because the sure profits are slow if the opinion becomes prevalent that all business is great only as it tends to the uncertain the extravagant and the romantic then we may stay our hand at once nor waste labor in absurd expostulations of honesty i had as lief preach humanity to a battle of eagles as to urge honesty and integrity upon those who have determined to be rich and to gain it by gambling stakes and madmen's ventures all the bankruptcies of commerce are harmless compared with the bankruptcy of public morals should the atlantic ocean break over our shores and roll sheer across to the pacific sweeping every vestige of cultivation and burying our wealth it would be a mercy compared with that ocean deluge of dishonesty and crime which sweeping over the whole land has spared our wealth and taken our virtue what are the cornfields and vineyards what are stones and manufactures what are gold and silver and all the precious commodities of the earth among beasts and what are men bereft of conscience and honor but beasts we will forget those things which are behind and hope a more cheerful future we turn to you young men all good men all patriots turn to watch your advance upon the stage and to implore you to be worthy of yourselves and of your revered ancestry o oh, ye favorite of heaven with a free land a noble inheritance of wise laws and a prodigality of wealth in prospect advance to your possessions may you settle down as did israel of old a people of god in a promised and protected land true to yourselves true to your country and true to your god End of Twelve Causes of Dishonesty by Rev. Henry Ward Beecher
The Twelve Wild Ducks by Sir George Webb Descent. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Twelve Wild Ducks Once on a time there was a queen who was out driving, when there had been a new fall of snow in the winter, but when she had gone a little way, she began to bleed at the nose, and had to get out of her sledge. And so, as she stood there, leaning against the fence, and saw the red blood on the white snow, she fell a-thinking how she had twelve sons and no daughter, and she said to herself, if only I had a daughter as white as snow and as red as blood, I shouldn't care what became of all my sons. But the words were scarce out of her mouth before an old witch of the trolls came up to her. A daughter you shall have, she said, and she shall be as white as snow and as red as blood, and your sons shall be mine. But you may keep them till the babe is christened. So when the time came, the queen had a daughter, and she was white as snow and as red as blood, just as the troll had promised, and so they called her Snow White and Rosy Red. Well, there was great joy at the king's court, and the queen was as glad as glad could be, but when what she had promised to the old witch came into her mind, she sent for a silversmith and bade them make twelve silver spoons, one for each prince, and after that she bade him make one more, and that she gave to Snow White and Rosy Red. But as soon as ever the princess was christened, the princes were turned into twelve wild ducks and flew away. They never saw them again. Away they went and away they stayed. So the princess grew up, and she was both tall and fair, but she was often so strange and sorrowful, and no one could understand what it was that failed her. But one evening the queen was also sorrowful, for she had many strange thoughts when she thought of her sons. She said to Snow White and Rosy Red, why are you so sorrowful, my daughter? Is there anything you want? If so, only say the word, and you shall have it. Oh, it seems so dull and lonely here, said Snow White and Rosy Red. Everyone else has brothers and sisters, but I am all alone. I have none, and that's why I'm so sorrowful. But you had brothers, my daughter, said the queen. I had twelve sons who were your brothers, but I gave them all away to get you. And so she told her the whole story. So when the princess heard that, she had no rest, for in spite of all the queen could say or do, and all she wept and prayed, the lassie would set off to seek her brothers, for she thought it was all her fault, and at last she got leave to go away from the palace. On and on she walked into the wide world. So far, you would never have thought a young lady could have strength to walk so far. So once, when she was walking through a great, great wood, one day she felt tired, and sat down on a mossy tuft and fell asleep. Then she dreamt that she went deeper and deeper into the wood, till she came to a little wooden hut, and there she found her brothers. Just then she woke, and straight before her she saw a worn path in the green moss, and this path went deeper into the wood. So she followed it, and after a long time she came to just such a little wooden house as that she had seen in her dream. Now when she went into the room there was no one at home, but there stood twelve beds, and twelve chairs, and twelve spoons, a dozen of everything in short. So, when she saw that, she was so glad she hadn't been so glad for many a long year, for she could guess at once that her brothers lived here, and that they owned the beds and chairs and spoons. So she began to make up the fire, and sweep the room, and make the beds, and cook the dinner, and to make the house as tidy as she could. And when she had done all the cooking and work, she ate her own dinner, and crept under her youngest brother's bed and lay down there, but she forgot her spoon upon the table. So she had scarcely laid herself down before she heard something flapping and whirring in the air, and so all the twelve wild ducks came sweeping in, but as soon as ever they crossed the threshold they became princes. Oh, how nice and warm it is in here, they said. Heaven bless him who made up the fire and cooked such a good dinner for us. And so each took up his silver spoon and was going to eat. But when each had taken his own, there was one still left lying on the table, and it was so like the rest that they couldn't tell it from them. This is our sister's spoon, they said, and if her spoon be here, she can't be very far off herself. If this be our sister's spoon and she be here, said the eldest, she shall be killed, for she is to blame for all the ill we suffer. And this she lay under the bed and listened to. No, said the youngest, t'were a shame to kill her for that. She has nothing to do with our suffering ill, for if any one's to blame it's our own mother. 
So they set to work hunting for her both high and low, and at last they looked under all the beds, and so when they came to the youngest prince's bed they found her and dragged her out. Then the eldest prince wished again to have her killed, but she begged and prayed so prettily for herself. Oh, gracious goodness, don't kill me, for I've gone about seeking you these three years, and if I could only set you free I'd willingly lose my life. Well, said they, if you will set us free you may keep your life, for you can if you choose. "'Yes, only tell me,' said the princess, "'how it can be done, and I'll do it, whatever it be.' "'You must pick thistle down," said the princess, "'and you must card it and spin it and weave it. "'And after you have done that, "'you must cut out and make twelve coats and twelve shirts "'and twelve neckerchiefs, one for each of us. "'And while you do that, "'you must neither talk nor laugh nor weep. "'If you can do that, we are free. "'But where shall I ever get thistle down enough "'for so many neckerchiefs and shirts and coats?' "'asked Snow White and Rosy Red. "'We'll soon show you,' said the princes. "'And so they took her with them to a great wide moor, "'where there stood such a crop of thistles, "'all nodding and nodding in the breeze, "'and the down all floating and glistening like gossamers "'through the air in the sunbeams. "'The princess had never seen such a quantity of thistle down in her life, "'and she began to pluck and gather it as fast and as well as she could.' and when she got home at night she set to work carding and spinning yarn from the down. So she went on a long, long time, picking and carding and spinning, and all the while keeping the prince's house, cooking and making their beds. At evening home they came, flapping and wearing like wild ducks, and all night they were princes, but in the morning off they flew again and were wild ducks the whole day. But now it happened once, when she was out on the moor to pick thistle down, and if I don't mistake, it was the very last time she was to go thither. It happened that the young king who ruled that land was out hunting, and came riding across the moor, and saw her. So he stopped there, and wondered who the lovely lady could be that walked along the moor picking thistle down, and he asked her her name, and when he could get no answer he was still more astonished, and at last he liked her so much that nothing would do but he must take her home to his castle and marry her. So he ordered his servants to take her and put her up on his horse. Snow White and Rosy Red, she wrung her hands and made signs to them, and pointed to the bags in which her work was, and when the king saw she wished to have them with her, he told his men to take up the bags behind them. When they had done that, the princess came to herself little by little, for the king was both a wise man and a handsome man too, and he was as soft and kind to her as a doctor. But when they got home to the palace, and the old queen, who was his stepmother, set eyes on Snow White and Rosy Red, she got so cross and jealous of her because she was so lovely, that she said to the king, Can't you see now that this thing whom you have picked up, and whom you are going to marry, is a witch? Why, she can't either talk or laugh or weep. But the king didn't care a pin for what she said, but held on with the wedding, and married Snow White and Rosy Red, and they lived in great joy and glory. But she didn't forget to go on sewing at her shirts. So when the year was almost out, Snow White and Rosy Red brought a prince into the world, and then the old queen was more spiteful and jealous than ever, and at dead of night she stole in to Snow White and Rosy Red while she slept, and took away her babe and threw it into a pit full of snakes. After that she cut Snow White and Rosy Red in her finger, and smeared the blood over her mouth and went straight to the king. Now come and see, she said, what sort of a thing you have taken for your queen. Here she has eaten up her own babe. Then the king was so downcast, he almost burst into tears, and said, Yes, it must be true, since I see it with my own eyes. But she'll not do it again, I'm sure, and so this time I'll spare her life. So before the next year was out, she had another son, and the same thing happened. The king's stepmother got more and more jealous and spiteful. She stole into the young queen at night while she slept, took away the babe and threw it into a pit full of snakes, cut the young queen's finger and smeared the blood over her mouth, and then went and told the king she'd eaten up her own child. Then the king was so sorrowful, you can't think how sorry he was, and he said, yes, it must be true, since I see it with my own eyes, but she'll not do it again, I'm sure, and so this time too I'll spare her life. Well, before the next year was out, Snow White and Rosy Red brought a daughter into the world, and her, too, the old queen took and threw into the pitful of snakes while the young queen slept. Then she cut her finger, smeared the blood over her mouth, and went again to the king and said, Now you may come and see if it isn't as I say. She's a wicked, wicked witch, for here she is gone, and eaten up her third babe, too. 
Then the king was so sad there was no end to it, for now he couldn't spare her any longer, but had to order her to be burnt alive on a pile of wood. But just when the pile was all ablaze, and they were going to put her on it, she made signs to them to take twelve boards and lay them round the pile, and on these she laid the neckerchiefs and the shirts and the coats for her brothers. But the youngest brother's shirt wanted its left arm, for she hadn't had time to finish it. And as soon as ever she had done that, they heard such a flapping and whirring in the air, and down came twelve wild ducks flying over the forest, and each of them snapped up his clothes and his bill and flew off with them. See now, said the old queen to the king, wasn't I right when I told you she was a witch? But make haste and burn her before the pile burns low. Oh, said the king, we've wood enough and to spare, and so I'll wait a bit, for I have a mind to see what the end of all this will be. As he spoke, up came the twelve princes riding along, as handsome, well-grown lads as you'd wish to see, but the young prince had a wild duck's wing instead of his left arm. "'What's all this about?' asked the princes. "'My queen is to be burnt,' said the king, "'because she's a witch, and because she's eaten up her own babes.' "'She hasn't eaten them at all,' said the princes. "'Speak now, sister. You have set us free and saved us. Now save yourself.' Then Snow White and Rosy Red spoke, and told the whole story, how every time she was brought to bed, the old queen, the king's stepmother, had stolen into her at night, had taken her babes away and cut her little finger, and smeared the blood over her mouth, and then the princes took the king and shewed him the snake pit where three babes lay playing with adders and toads, and lovelier children you never saw. So the king had them taken out at once, and went on to his stepmother, and asked her what punishment she thought that woman deserved who could find it in her heart to betray a guiltless queen and three such blessed little babes. She deserves to be fast bound between twelve unbroken steeds, so that each may take his share of her, said the old queen. You have spoken your own doom, said the king, and you shall suffer it at once. So the wicked old queen was fast bound between twelve unbroken steeds, and each got his share of her. But the king took Snow White and Rosy Red and their three children, and the twelve princes, and so they all went home to their father and mother, and told all that had befallen them, and there was joy and gladness over the whole kingdom, because the princess was saved and set free, and because she had set free her twelve brothers. End of The Twelve Wild Ducks by Sir George Webb Descent, read by Colleen McMahon. A Dozen Dainty Recipes for Preparing War Department canned meats by mrs anna b scott this is a librivox recording read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b for more than ten years mrs scott has been the cooking expert and food economist of the philadelphia north american she has had phenomenal success in producing highly palatable and nutritious meals at a very low cost over a period of many years during which she was engaged in the business of operating public eating houses she is now devoting her entire time in teaching the american housewife to produce for the family better food at a lower cost in labor and money during her connection with the north american mrs scott has written many special articles including menus for commercial concerns interested in introducing new kinds of prepared food she also has been employed by government agencies to prepare menus for new foods introduced in this country and to instruct the public in the use of foods placed on sale by the government since the close of the war mrs scott has organized a cooking club which comprises more than twenty thousand members those members call upon her for personal direction the recipes included in this book under her name are the result of a series of tests made in her laboratory and kitchen every one of which was carefully analyzed and tried out they represent a dozen of the best dishes mrs scott could suggest from something like a score which she tested and found tasty forward war department canned meats corned beef corned beef hash roast beef and bacon are being offered to the american public by the quartermaster department at prices considerably below existing market quotations these meats are not being retailed by the government 
for more than a year seventy-seven army quartermaster retail stores and branches sold them in small quantities across the counter recently however when the army reorganization was accomplished and the needs of the new military forces definitely ascertained several million dollars worth were declared surplus made available for sale and offered to the public because of the large amount and the desire of the secretary of war to throw all the force of the war department into the campaign to reduce the cost of living the meats were offered to the wholesale and retail trades at prices which will permit them to be resold at figures much below those obtaining elsewhere and still realize a reasonable profit there is no question as to the high quality of war department meats packed by the leading packing houses of north and south america from the choicest cuts they were prepared under special supervision not only from the packers but from the united states government the american army at home and abroad found these meats in their daily rations a healthier or brawnier set of men than these returning from overseas never has been seen they thrived on war department canned meats often going for weeks with nothing to eat except these products they tasted good in france that same flavor that same high nutritive value and quality is found in them today recipes all tested on the following pages will be found an even dozen of recipes selected from among a score of excellent ones which show the possibilities of these products these meats should form a part of the menu in every home they are much cheaper than other canned meats although both were packed by the same packing house they are nutritive and they are appetizing the war department already has sold millions of dollars worth of these meats thousands of persons who have until now known canned meats only as a name recognize them as valuable additions to their daily rations if the dealers of the united states have not taken advantage of the war department offerings it is their own fault the consuming public is urged to ask its dealers to lay in a supply of these meats as long as they last if the dealer hasn't them he can get them six army supply bases located in reasonable halls of every section of the country will accept orders for as little as two hundred fifty dollars worth of meats the war department gives its guarantee to stand behind every can that is sold if the american public is desirous of reducing its cost of living it will avail itself of the opportunity offered by the government if the dealers in any locality have failed to place orders it is to the advantage of their patrons to insist that they do so war department canned meats are tasty they are nutritious they are cheap serve them in your home ask for them in cafes restaurants hotels on dining cars steamships and wherever food is served and ask for them by name war department canned meats talk to your dealer look for the dealer who carries war department canned meats unless he is laid in a stock he is not doing himself justice or you look for the red white and blue posters in store windows until the consumers in general are determined to reduce the cost of living and effect a saving for themselves prices cannot be reduced in offering these meats to the public the government is doing its utmost to place them in american pantries and kitchens in the most direct way labels do not appear on all the cans order the meats by name war department however very few if any dealers will decline to carry them once they understand the advantages to both themselves and their customers every dealer should take advantage of the offer you should see that he does order from your dealer and if he cannot supply you ask your depot quartermaster for the name of a dealer who can unless there is cooperation the public will not derive as great a benefit from the sale as is otherwise possible a dozen dainty recipes by mrs anna b scott canned beef croquettes with tomato sauce two cups canned roast beef two cups cold boiled rice one cup cream sauce one teaspoon salt pepper to taste one half teaspoon grated nutmeg one tablespoon finely chopped parsley bread crumbs and one egg 
put meat and rice through food chopper add sauce and other ingredients mix well spread on plate put in cold place when cold and firm take a tablespoon into floured hands and mold into cones or oblong shapes after all are molded dip in well beaten egg which has been mixed with one tablespoon of milk then in fine bread crumbs fry in very hot fat or cooking oil this recipe is sufficient for a family of four baked meat pie number two made from canned beef two cups canned roast beef one cup rice one cup tomatoes one tablespoon grated onion one teaspoon salt dash paprika and chopped parsley wash the rice and put on to boil in three cups of boiling water when thick add the tomato onion and seasoning cook again until thick add the meat brush deep bake dish pudding pan or casserole with a little butter put in mixture and cover top with crust made as follows sift one cup flour with one rounded teaspoon baking powder a few grains of salt rub in one teaspoon shortening lightly and add enough cold milk to make a stiff dough put on floured board and roll out one quarter inch thick cover pie brush top with milk bake twenty to twenty five minutes in a moderate oven this makes a substantial dish this recipe is enough for a family of four canned corned beef with creamed cabbage two and one half cups canned corned beef one head of cabbage about one pound one teaspoon salt pepper and paprika one cup cream sauce cut the cabbage into small pieces and cover with cold water for thirty minutes drain and cover with boiling water and boil thirty to thirty five minutes in uncovered vessel drain and cover with cream sauce seasoned to taste mix well and boil three minutes while the cabbage is cooking the canned corned beef is heated in the can the canned corned beef is put in center of platter and the creamed cabbage around the edge sprinkle all with paprika and garnish with parsley this recipe is sufficient for a family of four baked meatloaf with peas two cups canned roast beef two cups stale bread one cup cold boiled potatoes one tablespoon grated onion or one half teaspoon nutmeg one tablespoon drippings or oil one teaspoon salt one eighth teaspoon paprika two tablespoons finely chopped parsley soak the bread in cold water a few minutes press between the hands until dry put in pan with the potatoes which have been put through fruit press or potato ricer with the drippings and onions cook until heated through add the meat which has been put through the food chopper the seasoning and flavoring mix well put into small well greased pan bake thirty minutes put in center of chopped plate with small boiled potatoes around cover with white sauce and the green peas around the potatoes this makes a most attractive dish this recipe is sufficient for a family of four canned roast beef with brown sauce two cups canned roast beef one tablespoon butter or substitute one tablespoon flour one tablespoon grated onion or one half teaspoon grated nutmeg two tablespoons raw carrot two tablespoons finely chopped parsley one tablespoon caramel one teaspoon salt dash paprika one cup lamb stock or milk put the butter onion and carrot into saucepan cook until onion is tender but not brown remove from fire add flour and stir until smooth return to fire add cold stock or milk slowly stir until smooth and boil five minutes add seasoning pour over the meat and place on stove to heat through serve on toast or toast points sprinkled with the parsley this recipe is sufficient for a family of four baked beef pie made from canned roast beef two cups canned roast beef two cups boiled potatoes one tablespoon fat or oil three tablespoons chopped onion two tablespoons chopped green pepper one teaspoon salt two cups rice stock place the fat onion and pepper in saucepan cook until tender but not brown add rice stock pour over the meat and potatoes mix well and place in baking dish which has been lined with dough made as follows one and one half cups flour one teaspoon baking powder one half teaspoon salt 
one teaspoon shortening sift the flour baking powder and salt in bowl add shortening and rub in very lightly add sufficient milk to make dough that will roll out line the baking dish and make cover for pie bake thirty five minutes this recipe is sufficient for a family of four canned corn beef hash on toast two cups canned corn beef one cup strained tomatoes one teaspoon scraped onion salt and pepper to taste two tablespoons finely chopped parsley or celery top chop the canned corn beef fine put into saucepan add tomatoes flavoring and seasoning put over fire and heat cover platter with toasted bread cover bread with corned beef hash and sprinkle with parsley and celery top this recipe is sufficient for a family of four canned corned beef with cabbage salad one can of corned beef one tablespoon mustard one quart of cabbage salad one hard-boiled egg two tablespoons chopped parsley or celery top put the canned corned beef through food chopper add mustard and mix well take a spoonful of mixture and form into balls or cone shapes and roll in finely chopped hard-boiled egg place the meat in center of chop plate and put the cabbage salad around sprinkle with chopped parsley cabbage salad is made as follows one green pepper four cups finely cut cabbage one cup french dressing or salad dressing of choice two tablespoons dried celery leaves or fresh chopped celery put the pepper through the food chopper and add to the cabbage add the dressing and celery leaves or one tablespoon of celery seed mix well the seasoning is put in the dressing one teaspoon salt one quarter teaspoon pepper one teaspoon of dried mustard two teaspoons sugar this recipe is sufficient for a family of four canned corned beef for sandwiches two cups canned corned beef one tablespoon made mustard two tablespoons finely chopped stuffed olives or pickles put the meat through food chopper add mustard and olives mix well spread between bread this mixture can be made and put into jelly glasses and will keep eight to ten days in a cold place canned corned beef made into cakes with sauce of choice two cups canned corned beef two cups cold boiled oat meat stiff two tablespoons scraped onion two tablespoons finely chopped parsley one tablespoon worcestershire sauce one teaspoon salt one eighth teaspoon paprika one egg put the meat through food chopper add the stiff cold boiled oatmeal seasoning and well beaten egg mix well together form into small cakes roll in flour and fry in cooking oil until a nice brown if there is a hot oven put a little drippings or butter substitute on top and bake twenty to twenty five minutes serve with sauce of choice this recipe is sufficient for a family of four minced canned beef on toast two cups canned roast beef one cup cream sauce one tablespoon chopped green peppers or celery two tablespoons tomato ketchup two tablespoons finely chopped parsley or celery top chop the meat quite fine and add to the cream sauce let it come to a boil then add the pepper or celery and ketchup salt and pepper to taste cover platter with nicely toasted bread then cover with the minced meat sprinkle with parsley or celery top and garnish with sprigs of parsley this recipe is sufficient for the family of four fricadella made from canned roast beef two cups canned roast beef two cups bread crumbs one egg one teaspoon salt dash pepper two tablespoons grated or scraped onion one tablespoon chopped parsley put the meat through food chopper add salt pepper bread crumbs that have been wet with a little cold water the well-beaten egg onion juice and parsley mix well and form into flat cakes sprinkle with flour brush bake pan with a little drippings put in the fricadella and place in a hot oven fifteen to eighteen minutes after removing fricadella from pan add one tablespoon flour wet with a little cold water and one tablespoon caramel seasoning to taste and enough rice stock or water to make one cupful of gravy this recipe is sufficient for a family of four how to prepare army bacon 
by an army ex-cook fried bacon place strips of thinly cut bacon on a board and with a broad-bladed knife cut the strips into narrow slices put in hot frying pan and cook until bacon is crisp and brown occasionally pouring off fat from pan turning often drain on brown paper broiled bacon place thin slices of bacon from which rind has been removed closely together in a fine wire broiler place broiler over dripping pan and bake in hot oven until bacon is crisp and brown turning once drain on brown paper fat which is dripped into pan can be used for frying liver eggs and potatoes liver and bacon cover with boiling water slice of liver cut one half inch thick let stand five minutes to draw out the blood drain wipe and remove the thin outside skin and veins add small strips of bacon sprinkle with salt and pepper place in a greased wire broiler five minutes turning often to obtain the best results from war department bacon it is recommended that the meat when taken from can be immersed in cold water placed upon a heater and allowed to remain until the water nears the boiling point then remove it and rinse it in cold water where to buy look for the red white and blue poster describing war department canned meats the dealer who displays this poster in his store is doing his bit to help this campaign along he is the dealer from whom you should buy you not only will save money on every can bought but you too will be doing your part in lowering living costs details of sale these are the wholesale prices and terms of sale to your dealer the corned beef corned beef hash and roast beef are packed mainly in one and two pound cans some in six pound cans the bacon is packed in twelve pound cans prices are as follows f o b storage point subject to the discounts named for quantity purchases corn beef number one can fifteen cents per can number two can twenty seven cents per can one pound cans eighteen cents per can six pound cans one dollar per can bacon twelve pound cans per can two dollars fifty cents crates approximating one hundred pounds in slabs per pound nineteen cents corned beef hash one pound cans fifteen cents per can two pound cans thirty eight cents per can roast beef number one cans nine cents per can number two cans eighteen cents per can one pound cans twelve cents per can two pound cans twenty four cents per can six pound cans seventy cents per can sausage number two cans park twenty five cents per can number two cans vienna twenty five cents per can table of discounts for quantity purchases made at one time two hundred fifty dollars to one thousand dollars net one thousand one dollars to two thousand five hundred dollars five per cent two thousand five hundred one to four thousand dollars ten per cent four thousand one dollars and over twenty per cent or full carload lot shipped at government expense if value of full carload is less than four thousand one dollars terms ten per cent with order and the remainder in ninety days on banker's acceptance further discounts as follows are authorized to customers ordering or reordering in carload lots the value of all purchases of canned meats made on or after november fifteenth nineteen twenty only to be considered with this scale of discounts when purchases reach fifty thousand dollars twenty four per cent net to prevail when purchases reach one hundred thousand one dollars twenty eight per cent net to prevail when purchases reach five hundred thousand one dollar thirty two per cent net to prevail when purchases reach one million one dollar and over thirty five per cent net to prevail this means that the total purchase by a customer in carload lots from time to time will be taken into consideration and the proper discount applied on the sum of all the purchases including the first carload lot the government reserves the right to deliver meats approximating the amount ordered if for any reason it cannot deliver the order complete all goods offered subject to prior sale prices are subject to change without notice order at once from your nearest depot quartermaster
depot quartermasters brooklyn new york fifty ninth street and first avenue chicago eighteen nineteen west thirty ninth street atlanta georgia transportation building boston army supply base san antonio texas san francisco california chief surplus property branch office of the quartermaster general munitions building washington d c end of a dozen dainty recipes for preparing war department canned meats by mrs anna b scott silent noon by dante gabriel rossetti this is a librivox recording read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by nemo silent noon your hands lie open in the long fresh grass the finger points look through like rosy blooms your eyes smile peace the pasture gleams and glooms neath billowing skies that scatter and amass all round our nest far as the eye can pass are golden kingcup fields with silver edge where the cowl parsley skirts the hawthorn hedge tis visible silence still as the hourglass deep in the sun-searched growths the dragonfly hangs like a blue thread loosened from the sky so this winged hour is dropped to us from above oh clasp we to our hearts for deathless dower this close companioned inarticulate hour when twofold silence was the song of love end of silent noon by dante gabriel rosetti twelve years in the saddle for law and order on the frontiers of texas by sergeant w j l sullivan a texas ranger this is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twelve Years in the Saddle Prefatory In offering this book to the public, I have not undertaken to present a history of my life. I do not consider my life of enough importance to warrant making a book about it. What I have undertaken to do is to tell some of the exciting experiences that have fallen to the lot of that noble band, the Texas Ranger Force, of which I had the honor to be a member for 12 years. I had the leading part, it is true, in the incidents related, but the reader will see that I was not the whole show. There were others. I have prefixed some brief notes concerning my ancestry and some incidents of my youth and have followed with two accounts written in my own plain way of the principal events of my career as a sergeant of the rangers. I have introduced plates herein made from photographs showing the faces of some of the most noted criminals in the annals of Texas. Also photo illustrations of some of my dear comrades, all of them in fact that I could procure for this edition of my book. In a future edition I will probably be able to add the likenesses of others. For valuable assistance in the preparation of these pages, I am indebted to numerous friends, who I will not enumerate by name, but whose kindness will ever be remembered by me. I solicit their continued help, and will appreciate suggestions that may be made by these and other friends, and patriotic Texans in general, for use in a contemplated future edition of this work. With a respectful bow to my audience, the public, and a plea for their indulgence instead of their exacting criticism, I am, very cordially, the author, W. J. L. Sullivan. Errata. Uh, page 79, third line from bottom of first paragraph, should read, quote, when I heard him make this remark, unquote, instead of, quote, when I made him make this remark, unquote. Uh, page 110, seventh line on the page, should read, quote, just after we entered the house, 
quote, instead of, quote, just before we entered the house, unquote. My ancestry. My father, Tom Sullivan, was born and raised at number 99 Broom Street, New York City, where he engaged in business as a master mechanic. My grandfather, John Sullivan, was born in Ireland. He and my grandmother moved to New York City and settled on Broom Street when my father, who was an only child, was born. My grandfather was a mason by order and also by occupation. Just before my father's death, my grandfather wrote him that he was coming to him to bring him $1,500 that he had collected from the rents of my father's property, which was in the city of New York. He started out with the money, as he said he would, and has never been heard of up to seven years ago when a bank book of his was found in a savings bank in New York. My father went to Perry County, Alabama, and met and married my mother, Summer McFarland, and they moved to Winston County, Mississippi, where my father engaged in farming until his death. End of prefatory. Across the Atlantic in a Twelve-Foot Boat by Frederick A. Talbot This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The majority of travelers nowadays, when their peregrinations necessitate an ocean journey, invariably seek out the largest vessel afloat, since by this means the inconvenience and discomfort of mal de mer, if not entirely obviated, are at least considerably reduced. Yet there are one or two intrepid adventurers for whom the sea possesses no terrors, and who apparently court fate by crossing the Atlantic in small boats no larger than the emergency boats carried upon our ocean liners. The doyen of these solitary voyagers is Captain William A. Andrews, who, owing to his curious propensity for crossing the Atlantic in a small boat, has earned the sobriquet of the Lonely Skipper he holds the record both for having crossed the atlantic in the smallest boat and in the quickest time by a craft of these diminutive dimensions it was at atlantic city the black pool of new york and philadelphia that i encountered this interesting and daring navigator although bordering on his sixtieth year captain andrews is still hale and virile and his weather-beaten face is a telling index of his sea-roving experiences. When I met him, he was busily engaged in fashioning a small model of the collapsible boat in which he intends to cross to England this year. Surely such an enterprise is fraught with considerable danger, I ventured to remark, as he explained the principles of the construction of the frail Argo having an indelible impression of the fury of the Atlantic in a hurricane and the havoc it had wrought upon the greyhound upon which I was travelling. By no means, he replied. Personally, I feel far safer in my little boats than I do upon the deck of a steamer. You see, you have plenty of sea-room, and should unfavourable weather be encountered, you can let the boat run before it. The only real danger is incurred from passing vessels, especially from the liners, I always endeavor to keep out of the track of the latter. I never carry lights at night, but simply trust to Providence. On one or two of my journeys I did display a white light at my masthead, and from what I subsequently learned, from the reports of vessels which passed me during the night, my solitary will-o'-the-wisp light occasioned considerable speculation among the superstitious sailors as to its origin. Captain Andrews is not, as his name might imply, a captain in the strict sense of the word. He holds no certificate, and in fact has never had a lesson in navigation in his life. He was originally engaged in a piano factory at Boston, but the trade became indifferent, and he decided to establish a business of his own. That was in 1878. Before proceeding to this step, however, he desired a holiday, and to see the old country. The Exposition Universelle was being celebrated in Paris in that year, and so he determined to visit it with a view to extending his knowledge. The chief point I had to consider, however, he continued, was how to get across. 
I was not in a position to pay for my passage in the ordinary way, but I had heard that a man named Johnson had crossed the ferry in 1875 in a small boat, twenty feet in length, and since success had crowned his effort, I saw no reason why I should not emulate his achievement. I mentioned the matter to my brother Walter, who immediately approved of the idea, and we at once completed our arrangements for our novel journey. I went down to Gloucester to the shipbuilder who had constructed Johnson's boat, and ordered a similar craft, sixteen feet in length. But the boat builder refused to build it less than twenty feet in length, as he was apprehensive of its being sufficiently safe. Seeing argument was useless, I let him have his own way, and in five days the boat, which we called the Nautilus, was delivered to us. We set out from Boston, Massachusetts, on June 8, 1878. A huge crowd gathered to wish us bon voyage, and a large fleet of boats accompanied us for a short distance. We did not get far before we encountered our first disaster in the shape of a broken compass. We put back into Beverly, and I seized the opportunity of waiting for the readjustment of the compass to have the sleeping accommodation rendered more comfortable. My bunk was only eleven inches in width and eight inches high, and I had to lie upon my side with the hatch open. This was due to the centerboard of the boat. The advantage of having such a small bunk is that one can brace oneself securely therein, so that when the vessel pitches and rolls there is no danger of being hurled out of the berth. The boat was not ballasted, and is the only craft that has accomplished such a journey under such conditions. When the alterations had been made and the compass rearranged, we made a fresh start. The weather was frightful, the wind blowing from the northeast, and no vessel would put to sea. Nothing daunted, and chafing at the delay already caused, we decided to put off, although everything augured an unsuccessful passage. Fortunately, however, the weather moderated when we got well out to sea. When we dropped out of sight of land that night, we vaguely wondered whether we should ever see it again. I had never been to sea before, I had no idea of navigation, and naturally had never taken an observation of the sun. Our plight seemed hopeless and the attempt foolhardy, but we resolved to continue the journey come what might. We took the observation of the sun whenever possible, and settled upon our course as well as we could. During the trip we spoke thirty-seven vessels, and by their aid we could rectify any errors we had made in our calculations regarding longitude and latitude. In spite of our deficient knowledge in this respect, we struck the Bishop's Rock off the Scilly Islands, and for which we had been making our way dead in a fog, so that we had not erred much in our observations. We made up to the Scilly Islands, and the following day entered the English Channel, and ran into Penzance, being under the impression that it was Falmouth. We experienced a difficult time in these waters. A northeast gale was blowing, and we got into the lizard race, the terror of all mariners. The sea was running high, and the tide was sweeping us along backwards against the wind at a speed of nine miles an hour. We finally landed at Mullion Cove, and right glad we were for the opportunity to get ashore to stretch our limbs, after being cramped up in the narrow confines of our little boat for forty-five days. We subsequently made our way to Havre, thence to Paris. After the exhibition we returned to England, where we stayed for several months exhibiting our boat, since the episode had aroused considerable attention. We then returned to the States, and shortly after our arrival home my brother was taken ill, and succumbed to the malady. Since the death of his brother, Captain Andrews has always entered upon his various expeditions alone. Although his first trip had been so uniformly successful, it was not until ten years later that he decided to undertake another similar excursion. Curiously enough, on this occasion, as with the former, the incentive was the Paris exhibition. But this time he determined to reap some pecuniary benefit from the undertaking, owing to the public interest that had been created by the accomplishment of his former trip. He thereupon set to work to construct another vessel. The Nautilus had been considered small, but this next craft was still more diminutive, being only fifteen feet in length overall. 
he originally intended to christen it the mermaid but when his projected trip was noised abroad an enterprising showman scenting dollars in such a side show induced captain andrews to take his boat upon a short tour and to call it the dark secret at first commented the captain i was not in favor of calling her by such a name it sounded ominous but he was adamant at last i told him i would only consent to do so for a hundred pounds thinking that the mention of such a high figure would preclude further insistence upon his part to my surprise however he closed with me immediately he also made another contract with me that i should tour with him with my boat for forty-seven weeks at a weekly remuneration of twenty pounds and expenses i started from the pier at point of pines near boston on june seventeenth the advantage of starting from boston is that the journey is some two hundred and fifty miles shorter and one enters the gulf stream much earlier the warmth of which is very appreciable while it carries you along at a splendid pace more than twenty eight thousand people witnessed my departure and as i had contracted to receive a percentage of the pier receipts for this event i netted a further two hundred and eighty pounds on this occasion i had the boat constructed with a hollow keel in which i intended to carry my water but before i sailed i was supplied with hygeia water in bottles i then admitted sea water into the keel to ballast the boat i had scarcely got clear of the land however when i experienced rough weather a strong headwind was blowing and the seas were running very high still i pushed on steadily hoping that the elements would become more propitious but my anticipations were doomed to disappointment for the weather became worse i was buffeted about for sixty-two days and made no progress in fact i was driven back after i had been out for a month i spoke a vessel which informed me that i was only one hundred fifty miles off boston this news depressed me but at the end of another fortnight when i spoke another vessel i was informed that i was only one hundred miles out to aggravate matters my water gave out and when i spoke a norwegian bark a few days later i was glad in one sense of the word to get on board and to sit down to a hearty meal in the captain's room after two months subsistence upon canned food when i reached america i learned that a mr j lawler had successfully crossed over to england in a small boat and had created a tremendous sensation this put me upon my mettle and i resolved to make another try i ordered another boat the mermaid the same dimensions as the dark secret while the boat was being built i met lawler and we agreed to race across the atlantic for a thousand pounds and a silver cup this was the first transatlantic race with small boats and it aroused widespread interest we started together from the ocean pier near boston on june seventeenth eighteen ninety one just before nightfall amid the huzzas of a large concourse of people the weather was extremely rough when we got away from land we decided upon our respective courses lawler went north and i went south lawler however must have changed his course soon after leaving me since i passed his sprit which he had cast adrift by this i saw that he was taking the same course as i projected my theories in this direction were further substantiated when i spoke a vessel which informed me that they had passed lawler all well three days before about a thousand miles ahead of me as for myself i encountered successive disasters my boat capsized seven times and on one occasion i was clinging to her bottom for half an hour she was wrongly constructed lawler had fitted his boat with a lead keel so that if she capsized she would right herself immediately my boat would not do this i had to right her the best way i could to make matters worse five days after we set out i ran into a cyclone the seas were so heavy that my boat was practically crippled all my stores were damaged and my water was lost under these circumstances i decided to seek assistance from a passing steamer i sighted the elbrus of antwerp and was taken on board i proceeded with her to antwerp and sold my boat for a handsome sum to a syndicate of showmen i then went to london and met lawler 
who had safely made a place near Land's End, and then went to Portsmouth, having accomplished the journey in about forty-three days. Although these last two attempts to cross the ferry had resulted in failure, Captain Andrews was by no means daunted, and he wagered Lawler that he would cross in thirty days. Lawler also decided to endeavor to lower his own record, and for this purpose both competitors set to work to construct special vessels. Captain Andrews christened his the Flying Dutchman, an auspicious name. Lawler called his the Christopher Columbus. While my vessel was being built, I was commissioned by the manufacturers of a well-known domestic commodity to name the vessel the Sapolio, and to undertake the trip on their behalf. I communicated to Lawler my projected course, which was to be from Cape Race to Queenstown, a distance of only 1,800 miles. Lawler replied that his designs were precisely the same. But I suddenly learned that a celebration was to be held in Spain in honor of Columbus, since the year was the 400th anniversary of the discovery of America. It then suddenly occurred to me that it would create a sensation if I were to sail for the very town from which Columbus had set out on his expedition. The Sapolio was fourteen feet over all, with a beam of five feet and a depth of two feet three inches. She was collapsible. I had thirty-nine square feet in the sails. Lawler, anxious to reap primary honors, had started on his trip before I was ready but he never reached his destination, for he was never heard of again. His tragic end did not deter me from my purpose, and so I set out on July twentieth, 1892. On this occasion fortune was kind to me. The weather was all that could be desired, and the wind was so favorable that I reached the Azores in thirty days, a distance of 2,500 miles. Profiting by my previous experience with the mermaid, I had a lead keel provided to the Sapolio, and it was a gigantic success. From the Azores I proceeded to Portugal, made my way up the coast, and finally reached the Spanish towns of Huelva and Palos. Upon his arrival in Spain the population became demented with delight. A large crowd met him at the landing stage, and the air was filled with vigorous cheering. The ladies, with their courtly Spanish grace, waved their handkerchiefs and greeted him with flowers, as he was paraded round the streets upon the shoulders of some of the swarthier citizens. Distinguished celebrities entertained him upon every side. The streets were thronged with enthusiastic sightseers. One old lady was heard to remark by the captain that the event ought to be recorded in natural history. The papers published glowing and lengthy accounts of his wonderful voyage. The government paid his expenses until his departure, making him a guest of the crown. The queen herself sent him an invitation, of which the captain cherishes pleasant memories. Photographers besieged him upon every side. He distributed no fewer than 560 photos of himself and boat to interested and curious sightseers. One enthusiast requested a piece of the American flag which had flown at the masthead of the Sepolio, but as his request was not complied with, he satisfied himself by taking the whole flag. Another gentleman was anxious to secure a photograph of the captain. The latter, desirous to oblige, withdrew five photographs from his pocket in order to let the gentleman make his own selection, but the Spaniard excitedly grabbed the whole five photographs and decamped exultingly. "'I thought he not only took the cake,' remarked the captain when relating this incident, but the wind out of me at the same time. Surely the monotony of traveling alone for so long must exert a depressing influence, I queried. I do not notice it. You see, I have a regular routine of work to perform during the day. In addition to attending to the boat, I keep a log, and also write an account of my experiences as I progress, for the American papers. These packages of manuscript, together with letters, I hand to the captains of the various ships I meet, with the request that they will kindly post them when they get ashore. I sleep when I feel so inclined. Formerly, at night-time, I used to heave too while I slept, but now I have fitted a device by which I am able to set the vessel's course before I turn in, and she will steer herself during the few hours I am asleep. 
I average in fair weather about 100 miles every 24 hours, which is by no means a despicable daily run considering the size of the boat. Since Captain Andrews completed his memorable trip to Spain in 35 days, he has made two other attempts to cross the Atlantic, but on neither occasion has he achieved his purpose. The first of these two trips was made in 1898 in the Phantom Ship, an unlucky name according to marine traditions, thirteen feet in length and carrying twelve square yards of sail. Curiously enough, the boom of this craft was longer than the boat itself. From the very commencement this voyage was unfortunate. Owing to unforeseen circumstances, I could not take my departure until August 24th, and as a consequence I encountered the full force of the September gales. I started from Atlantic City. I had not got far out when my first trouble overtook me. My boat leaked like a sieve, and I had to work might and main bailing the water out, otherwise she would have foundered. The sea was rough, and the boat constantly heeled over and lay upon her side, with the result that the water swamped her. The tins containing my provisions were knocked about and punctured so that their contents were spoiled and rendered unfit to eat. By September 20th I found I had no food. I had been twenty-seven days at sea and was now progressing very favorably, making about a hundred miles a day. But I could not subsist upon nothing, and I soon realized that unless I fell in with the ship it would go hard with me. On September 27th I espied a vessel— I hailed her, but she took no notice. I put on all sail and sped after her. They did not observe me, for the reason that they were busily engaged in taking in their sails which had been damaged by the storms. I presently attracted their attention, and they hove to. When I came alongside, they hauled me aboard and my boat after me, which they stowed away. You can form a comprehensive idea of the diminutive size of this boat, when I tell you that when folded up she was only four inches thick. Curiously enough, this vessel fulfilled the superstitious traditions of the sea, which is that any vessel which speaks a phantom ship is eventually lost. This ship subsequently went down off Dunkirk. No doubt had the sailors observed the name of my boat they would have refused to take me aboard, so strong are their superstitious natures. When I again reached Atlantic City, I could not rest, but immediately set about making preparations for another voyage. I had the phantom ship dismembered and rebuilt, only on this occasion she measured but twelve feet in length, and is the smallest vessel that ever essayed to cross the Atlantic. I christened her the Dory. Captain Andrews was to be accompanied on this expedition by Professor Miller, who created a tremendous sensation by stating that he was going to cross the herring pond by means of shank's pony he interviewed the captain on the subject and although the intrepid lonely voyager was naturally very skeptical of miller's ability to achieve the feat he consented to construct the necessary walking shoes in which the latter anticipated accomplishing the journey in our illustration professor miller is seen with his special walking shoes under either arm they each measured about five feet in length. As will be seen, they resembled miniature canoes in design, with a small orifice in the center to admit the foot, and were furnished with corrugated soles. Being manufactured of wood, they were, of course, buoyant, so that Miller had little fear of being dragged under water. But the absolute impracticability of his being able to withstand the enormous potency of the waves in mid-Atlantic never appealed to the professor, confident of unqualified success he started upon his foolhardy trip but it was not long before the folly of the scheme dawned upon him very forcibly he could not maintain his equilibrium and was to be naturally expected he was simply drifted about at the mercy of the waves after vainly endeavoring to make headway miller was at last reluctantly compelled to abandon the idea of walking from atlantic city to england I think this was the most remarkable trip I have undertaken, since, although I did not accomplish my object, I passed through a succession of experiences such as I never wish to meet with again. I was supplied with a large stock of Saratoga water, a natural effervescent drink. I sailed on June 17th from Atlantic City and made very fair progress. The weather was hot, 
and for some inexplicable reason I felt peculiarly drowsy. I had never experienced that sensation before. When I first commenced writing my log, for the first few minutes the writing was quite bold and distinct, but it soon resolved itself into an unintelligible scrawl, and I would fall asleep. At first I attributed this peculiarity to the heat. I took my observations in the usual manner, and conjectured that I was keeping a good course. One day, when I fell in with a vessel, wishing to rectify any errors that I might possibly have made, I asked the captain for the longitude. He gave it to me, and you can judge of my surprise when I found that his observation was three days ahead of mine. That is to say, I had traveled three days farther than I imagined. I thought he must be in error. I asked him the date of the month. July 1st, he retorted. You must be wrong, I replied. It is only June 27th. He quickly dissipated my doubts upon this point, and I was at my wit's end to account for such a flagrant error in my calculations. I continued my journey in a dazed condition. One day, when it was abnormally hot, I laid down in my bunk. Immediately I experienced a strange feeling of asphyxiation. I jumped up in alarm. Thinking it must be fancy on my part, I once more lay down, and the same curious sensation overtook me. I thereupon sought to discover the reason for this peculiarity. It was not a difficult search, for I found that the cork stoppers of my bottles of Saratoga water had shrunk under the influence of the intense heat, and that the carbonic acid gas had escaped and had collected in the bottom of the boat. This was the solution of my curious drowsy feeling. I could now account for my error in longitude. I must have been unconscious for those three days, since I never had the slightest recollection of them. Since I had now discarded my water, I kept a sharp lookout for a vessel to replenish my supply. The first ship I spoke was bound for Liverpool, where I was eventually landed. The trip Captain Andrews is going to make this year is in reply to a challenge issued by Captain Blackburn of Gloucester, Massachusetts, who a short time ago successfully crossed to England from his town. It is to be a race similar to that organized by Andrews and Lawler. The stipulations are that the boat must not exceed twenty feet in length. Captain Andrews proposes to make his attempt in a boat twelve feet long, since his experience with the dory convinced him that a craft of this dimension is splendidly adapted to such an expedition. End of Across the Atlantic in a Twelve-Foot Boat by Frederick A. Talbot Read by Maria Casper